cool. So you're doing this thing and you want to know about now and then. Right, 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 Lauren. It's nice. To, it's nice to meet you. My name is Anastasia. I'm a student of the Faculty of Journalism here in London. Yes, and I want to talk with you about uh, now and then. Yes. Uh, it will come out on Thursday. Are you excited? Sure. Oh, what does it make it so exciting? Oh, am I excited about the uh, the release? Yeah. Um, I'm excited to see what they do with it because they did wonders with Free as a Bird and Real Love. When they did this back then in the 90s, we knew those songs. I don't think we knew Free as a Bird, but we certainly knew Real Love. And at the time, it was opening up a John Lennon special, and it was different lyrics, you know, but we had heard demos of it. And then it was great to hear the original demo, which I have of Free as a Bird before George and Paul started adding a bridge and filling it out and making extra sections. And what makes this even more exciting is because of the technology that Peter Jackson developed with the Mal and AI system. He made the movie Get Back so extraordinary. I had over 60 hours of audio from those Get Back sessions in January and they were unlistenable because there'd be just tons of noise and clamoring around and people and instruments and somebody tuning and somebody yelling in the background and then somebody talking up front where you can hear something or a piece of a song for a second, but then it gets interrupted by somebody, you know, sharpening a pencil or dropping a glass or like it was just loud, soft, loud, soft. And so you could never listen to it anywhere where it was discernible about what's actually happening. And a lot of the music covered up the dialogue. So as you know, this technology separated all those tracks and get back so we could have clean guitar, clean drums, clean bass, clean vocals, clean dialogue. And then he remixed everything with beautiful restored picture that it was phenomenal. So that's what's promising that this is going to be so cool because they've been able to lift John's voice out technically and clean all by itself. And if there's any restoration it needs, fine, but there's nothing artificial. It'll be really John's voice as if he had showed up and sang it mm -hmm. now, you know, like today. And I hope that George and uh, Paul back then when they were considering this song wrote another the bridge for the song or something, you know, like I'm, I'm trying to guess as to what they might have added uh, because they did wonders with the other songs. And it sounded, this particular demo sounded like an unfinished idea of John's. Mm -hmm. um, these uh, AI technologies, uh, do you think that makes the song less uh, authentic? No, because they're not doing anything artificial to it. They're just extricating it cleanly. You know, it's like laser surgery rather than somebody screwing up with a scalpel, perhaps, you know, <laughs> it's more precise. It's going to be pure John, you know, whereas when John's voice was weak in the older demos of Real Love and Free as a Bird, Paul had to imitate John and he, he sang along with John to strengthen the vocal in some spots. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I understand that John wrote this song for Paul, but I'm not sure I understand uh, the whole background background of the story. Um, what happened between them? There were so many business differences. And, you know, when the four of them got together, they just said, let's make a partnership. It was a four way agreement and they never did anything unless the four of them agreed on it. All of a sudden, they were all disagreeing on various things. Who wanted the band to go this direction? More live shows, uh, more studio, uh, disband and do other things. What became frustrating was that John and Paul no longer were able to just carve up the album to themselves and just give one song to Ringo and one song to George. George started writing so many more songs that he wanted more songs on each album. And he had so many tunes as a creative person that he would have had to wait for another 25 Beatle albums to get all of his songs released. So his idea was, look, you know, the band, uh, this artist, that artist, all these people do these solo things, you know, like, why can't we each do our solo albums and come back and do a Beatle album? 
it would have been a really cool way for them to do it but somehow it didn't work out john met yoko he started getting more experimental and then the three of them wanted one business partner where paul didn't trust him paul didn't trust alan klein he had heard bad things he had been through court and he had already ripped off the rolling stones and a few other artists so paul was like no 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 i'll stick with my in-laws because it turned out that Linda's family were lawyers, her father and brother. And the other three were like, he's gonna be biased to you. He's gonna give you a better deer. We're, 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 we're gonna suffer from it. And he was like, no, I'm sure it could be honest, you know, but they three wanted one lawyer uh, manager and um, McCartney wanted these guys. And so there was that giant rift. And then when Paul said, look, I really want out too. Each one had, you know, left the band at different times. Um, there was no way to just say, I'm going to sue Alan Klein because I know he's a crook. Alan wasn't part of the original Beatles partnership, only the four Beatles were. The only way to end that thing if they didn't write out their contract was to su sue the other three guys to break the partnership, to say there's been a breach of agreement and we need out of this thing so that we can each individually receive the money we've all earned all these years. Everybody around the Beatles was a freaking millionaire and the Beatles weren't even getting their share. They're still getting their measly little, you know, salary or whatever, you know, but once their original manager, Brian Epstein died in 1966, they didn't know anything about where their money was, who paid the bills, how to do taxes. Like Brian took care of everything for them. So they didn't know anything about it. And so Paul was then told by his lawyer in-laws you have to sue the other three guys. And he said, I can't do that. They're my brothers. You know, I can never do that. He said, it's the only way for you all to get your money and to save the Beatle empire because Klein is going to run away with it all. Klein was already ripping them off. And the other lawyers knew that. So Paul summoned them. You know, he started the suing process, which infuriated the other three. And then they were accusing him, Paul, of getting a bigger share because Paul was buying up more copyrights without telling the other guys. And he was just looking out for himself because everybody just seemed to be bickering and nobody was listening to anybody. And he was just doing what he had to do. I mean, he had money. He's Paul McCartney for God's sake. And he couldn't have access to any of his money. Luckily his new wife, Linda had had a little bit of a savings and they lived on that for a while because everything was like put into a holding you know, like a escrow kind of a, um, what do they call that when it's delayed, like nobody could get their hands on their money. So it was a big mess for a long time. So anytime they talked business, all of them were infuriated with each other because they were just so frustrated that this happened to them. And they were so close and loved each other like brothers that it just, just seemed like a giant mess blowing up. And you know how it is when you're bickering with friends or family. Sometimes one's feeling more forgiving and the other one's still a little annoyed and you just can't necessarily communicate eye to eye and be in the same place at the same time. But then, you know, they started niggling at each other in the press and that was sort of what it was about. And then people started reading things into it and saying this song was written about that and this one was... Then they started doing it on purpose and they, you know, put their little messages to each other in the different songs. But deep down, they just loved each other and they were getting along great until, you know, the big murder, conspiracy, horror. Mm -hmm. All these giant answers. Good thing you're recording this. <laughs> um, I, but just, just to make that one clear, I mean, it, it's obvious that on the business side, they could have bridged their differences. <laughs> Um, on the business side, they could have bridged their differences in many ways on the personal matters, but then uh, John and Paul stopped talking for a long time, if I remember correctly. They they, they had something more of a more personal rift, or am I missing that? Am I reading? No, it? the press made it out to be worse than it was, you know. Um, if you watch the new May Pang movie called The Lost Weekend that came out in 2022, You'll see that John and uh, Paul were talking, Paul and Linda were visiting many times from like 74 through 75. They saw each other and talked a lot. They even jammed together in LA, you know? And Paul and uh, Linda had visited just before Christmas uh, uh, in 1980. 
so yeah they they were talking and things were good between them but the press was still like oh bitter feud you know then, then why the um the lyrics the now and then i still think of you uh still miss you why um it's uh, when, when he actually Uh, yeah, sorry, can I just read it? Yes, in the song, John Lennon declares, now and then I miss you, now and then I want to return to me. And I want you to return to me. Why? Well, uh, it depends on when he wrote that song, uh, whether it's really written about Paul or not. It could be about his mom, you know? Mm -hmm. It could be about anybody else he misses in his life. It could be just that it feels nice, you know? Uh, unless people are actually writing a song, they don't really know that the angst a songwriter can feel or the heartache and longing that is maybe natural for artists can sometimes come out and you say things that fit what you're actually feeling, whether or not it's specifically about somebody. I mean, so many of my songs, it's a moment of the feeling towards this person or that person or a line that I had heard as I was falling asleep when I was thinking of this situation or that, but it isn't always directly on one person. I don't know if it's the press assuming that this was written for Paul or if John intentionally was writing an answer to Paul. It depends when the demo was actually written. Do you have so, a year? So you, think maybe, uh, so you think maybe the fact that it was written for Paul on the cassette is just because he wanted to give the cassette to him for him to complete the song and work with him? Oh, when it said for Paul on the cassette, it could have been Yoko saying, give this to Paul. I, that's what I assumed. Oh, I understood it to be John's uh, writing. It could be John's writing and it could be that he wanted Paul to finish the song. I don't I don't remember ever hearing anything about that. Mm -hmm. So for you, it's not a love song. Oh, I don't know. I don't even know all the lyrics. It was hard to make out the words in the original demo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, that, that was great. Um, let us just go over to see that we covered everything that we wanted to ask. Okay. I, I just fell in love with the storytelling here. <laughs> just, I, love, I love how there's an aspect here that is actually a third person going into their relationship, the press, and making it all, creating a discussion that wasn't necessarily there. Well, it's possible, you know. I wasn't there when John was writing it. He wasn't telling me what he was thinking about, so I don't know. You know, but I do know that he'd probably be excited that these three songs, Free as a Bird, Real Love, and uh, Now and Then are his, and that somebody took the time, the other three took the time to finish these and make them all money. At least his estate's making money, his wife and second son are making money from it. I remember even George said before he died, Well, I hope somebody takes my shit demos and turns them into hits when I'm dead, you know, and uh, I wish Paul would uh, work with Olivia and finish some of George's tunes because he's got a lot of unfinished stuff. But this is the last one that all four of them are actually playing on or singing on in John's case. So that's why they're calling it the last Beatles single. Okay. Uh I think that's it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very great. much. You're welcome. Yeah. Did you happen to see some of the latest articles about it? Did you get the, uh, like, because the Beatles.com and um, probably AppleRecords.com have some facts about what this is about and what it's doing and how they're making it? I'll go look at the other stuff. I think we saw something on the Rolling Stones. I'm not sure it was on the Rolling Stones. Yeah, um, I'll forward you something in case... I'll, I'll just show you what I was reading, where this information came from. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. I can't wait to hear it, if to be honest. I, I, I'm just like... <laughs> Did you feel that way when, or you, maybe you weren't on the planet in 1995? I don't know. No, when the, uh, the other stuff came out, I felt like it was a gimmick. At, at the time, I felt like it was more uh, incomplete. Not This one, I feel like a lot of thought and effort went into it. I don't feel like it was, okay, let's put something out there to, to, to take money out of Beatles fans. I feel like this time there's like a dedication of heart. I don't know why I feel that way. There were a, another few releases that were post-mortem that I felt that way about. But as a whole, I didn't feel about... Did you feel that way uh, about Free as a Bird and Real Love? 
those specific Free songs? Free the Bird, I did. We Love, I don't know why I didn't. There's no reason to. I mean, they they both came out in the same way. And um, well, I think at first most the anthology was... didn't take me. The anthology, I was like, hmm. Well, those were all unfinished demos and alternate takes. And yeah. most of us had all of those anyway. They just were cleaner versions, which were nice and remastered. But it wasn't anything supposed to be brand new or spectacular. It was just, you know, we're scraping the bottom of all the demos and things we have. And we're going to release some of these because they're interesting to us. Especially when you hear them writing a song or choosing, I'm going to go to this chord versus that chord. You hear John thinking through his demos going, oh, I could go here or I could go there. You're, you're in on the creative process. He doesn't even know he's going to go ooh, 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 there, you know, but you do because you know the finished record, you know. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Uh, but I remember being very emotional about Free as a Bird and Real Love. Real Love, I knew the song because it was different lyrics and it was a demo of John's in a different way all the little boys and girls it started like that there's a film that starts with it like that and i just didn't like hearing all the jeff lynn stuff with it as much as i love jeff lynn and the electric light orchestra i would have rather that george martin produced it rather than jeff lynn but george martin turned down the project because his ears were going and i guess giles martin was probably too young at that point <laughs> to take over for him and then George just said, well, I'll do it if Jeff Lynn is in on it because Jeff Lynn was such a good friend to George. And Jeff Lynn had a hell of a time because technology sucked in those days to do this kind of thing. And he had to try to keep putting John's voice and the piano in some kind of a real time template. It was constantly time stretching and moving things around and it was really bad. You know, the technology was not ready to do this back then. So it was really hard. Jeff Lynne spent a fortune of time trying to get that right. And then eventually, you know, I didn't mind that it also sounded like the Beatles, but Jeff Lynne with the Beatles, you know. Like some producers have a way of producing a song where they're invisible and you just hear the artist in a professional way. And some people sort of put their spin on it, you know. And some recording engineers just capture what the band is duty, doing and some between the arranger and the producer and the engineer they enhance what's going on like a good example is if you listen to the demo of instinct karma there's no reverb or slap back echo on it and it just sounds like a few people in a room slamming through a tune and it doesn't sound like the amazing exciting single at all and if you listen to just bruce springsteen screaming over the band trying to see Bye! in the USA without that gunshot snare it just sounds stupid it's just pop 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 it sounds like Bruce Springsteen is singing and giving it his all and the band isn't even there hardly supporting his energy but as soon as uh Bob Clearmountain put that gunshot snare on it, then all of a sudden he had a single, right? So you can't say one way of producing a song versus another is correct while the other one is wrong. It just depends on what the artist likes and what the song does and what the ideas are. And if everybody agrees that that should be the way it goes, but it's really interesting. But, you know, Jeff Lynne definitely had a with all his arpeggiated stuff. You're like, that's not a Beatle thing. That's a Jeff Lynne thing. That should have been left out. <laughs> and I love Jeff Lynne. <laughs> so I've gotten used to it. Much more than you need. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you very much. It was really nice. You're welcome. Yeah. Be well. It's been a pleasure to see you again. I hope Good we'll get another too. excuse, even though it's the last song, technically. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, we don't have to talk Beatles, right? We could just talk guitar. Ooh. <laughs> so, great. Well, it was great to meet you and to see you again, Bill. And uh, thanks for asking. Take care. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.